So let's have a look now at the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so again, if particularly if we're using wireless communications, but in actual fact, even if we are using wired communications, uh, that the signal that's actually going down the wire is actually still an electromagnetic signal, and it will still have a frequency and a wavelength. Uh, but if we have a look uh, at the range of frequencies, so uh, at zero hertz, uh, this is DC. This is uh, there is uh, no dynamic signal in there at all. Once we get up to about 10 kilohertz, this is about the lowest that radio uh, tends to use. Um, some of these actually even lower frequencies do get used, for example, for underwater submarine communications, uh, where they can travel tremendous distances through water. Uh, but for uh, most purposes, we're not interested in those sorts of lengths, because again, think about the bandwidth and how slow the data rate might actually need to be. Uh, but if you just need to tell a submarine that there's a nuclear war when they need to fire a missile, uh, then some militaries are quite happy to have a very, very low data rate signal. Okay, uh, back to radio then. This really goes from about 10 kilohertz up to of the order of 100 megahertz or a few hundred megahertz uh, or even a gigahertz, depending on who you talk to. Uh, it really dictates a little bit where that line between radio and microwave uh, tends to be drawn. Um, and then that goes up to, again, the the end line for microwave and infrared uh, varies a little bit depending who you're uh, talking to. Uh, and things like Wi-Fi typically and cellular uh, communications typically these days are in the microwave uh, wavelengths. Then as we go higher, we get into infrared. Uh, so these are predominantly involved in carrying heat, but you can carry uh, you know, uh, data over them as well if you make the right, if you think about uh, making uh, the correct kind of links. Uh, we then have uh, a spot for visual, uh, the visible spectrum, which for some reason has been left out of this chart, which is a little curious. And then UV is ultraviolet light. So this is the light with shorter wavelengths than that which we can see. Uh, this is the frequencies that cause sunburn uh, as well. Uh, and again, the wavelengths are getting shorter and shorter. And it's interesting. So the, the point at which you go from visible light to ultraviolet light is actually the point at which uh, the photons in the light carry enough energy to ionize atoms, so to, to knock electrons out of atoms. And this is actually the kind of damage that UV causes to your cells. Uh, you get these free electrons around uh, and you can get chemical disruption uh, with UV. This is why things kind of fall, to, fall apart in the sun, uh, particularly here in Australia where our sun uh, in the summer is very, very strong indeed. Then as you go higher, you get into X-rays and gamma rays. So X-rays we know are used medically. Uh, and gamma rays uh, tend to be produced by uh, nuclear reactions, including um, suns uh, and other stars and other astronomical phenomena. Um, and they're quite nasty in terms of what they will do to your body uh, as well. So that's when we talk about radiation exposure, we normally mean uh, X-ray and gamma ray. Uh, and the higher the frequency, the worse it is for your body. So X-rays now and then uh, are overall helpful for your body because they're trying to find out something else that's wrong. Uh, but you don't just go having an X-ray every morning uh, and afternoon just for the fun of it because uh, there is a trade-off in the cumulative dose. So then if we have a look at how these are used for uh, communication, so we've talked about uh, so radio, so AM, the old amplitude modulation radio, uh, that's actually still used in a lot of places. Again, the frequency is very low, so typically somewhere of the order of one megahertz. Uh, one of the great advantages of AM is actually at those frequencies uh, is that it will go over the horizon. It kind of, particularly over open ocean, uh, it will follow the curvature of the earth around. Uh, and so it's used for communication, uh, for radio broadcasting uh, in the Pacific Ocean, for example. Uh, then we go up to uh, high frequencies. So the FM radios that we're more familiar with uh, tend to be around the 100 megahertz band and TV signals tend to be broadly speaking similar area tending to go a little bit higher just because the bandwidth requirements um, are higher because you need more data or more information content in a picture with sound than just in the sound. Um, coaxial cables uh, whether that's for uh, pay TV or cable internet uh, and those sorts of things tends to cover this more or less this whole kind of band there up to uh, a few hundreds of megahertz, even a little bit higher these days, but generally speaking, not much higher. Uh, then 
Uh, above that, we start getting uh, satellite and terrestrial microwave. And again, it depends who you talk to as to where the ends of these are, including relative to one another. Um, satellites, uh, I would say, generally speaking, tend to be more from sort of 10 to the 9 uh, hertz, so from a gigahertz and above. But there are some satellites that are well down into the UHF band uh, here in sort of the, you know, the few hundreds of megahertz. Uh, and again, that... Uh, the emergency beacons, for example, operate at 406 megahertz, which is uh, well and truly down here. Uh, and then terrestrial microwave from about a gigahertz up to some tens of gigahertz. Uh, fiber optics, of course, are operating at a much higher frequency now uh, because it's generally speaking infrared visible uh, or UV light bands. Now, what's important uh, in this is that these are not the data rates per se of these links, but again, remember. Uh, from the Shannon Hartley theorem, the wider the band, the more data you can fit in. And because as you go up in frequencies, the gaps between these uh, bands are bigger. So between 10 to the 14 and 10 to the 15 hertz, there is nine times 10 to the 14 hertz. This is a much larger number than, for example, the AM band. Um, if we look between 10 to the five and 10 to the six hertz, there's nine times 10 to the fifth hertz. It's a much narrower frequency band by many orders of magnitude uh, than up here at fiber optic. So that's actually what enables things like fiber optic to carry more data, uh, is actually that you have a much wider band uh, available potentially, uh, and also just that those frequencies, even a narrower band uh, will uh, often let you carry more because you can get a better signal to noise ratio. Inside a fiber optic cable, um, your interference source is other light and you can make a very dark inside of the cable so that you might have a signal to noise ratio uh, that might be in the millions or billions. Uh, and so this is also a, uh, a factor in there. So again, it depends on the, the kind of link as to what kind of bandwidth uh, you might get. So the old dial-up modems that uh, some of you may or may not remember, depending on your age, uh, were typically in the, you know, a few tens of uh, kilobits per second. Um, ISDN is now almost dead. Uh, this was kind of the fancy big brother to dial up uh, telephony that the, mob the uh, telephone networks liked uh, to promote because they like to charge a fortune for it. Uh, and so they thought, yes, you can have a, a guaranteed 64 or 128 kilobits, uh, and in return, we will charge you an arm and a leg every month uh, for that, um, which is actually why DSL was invented uh, to avoid this cost. And it's also why a lot of the uh, telephone operators really resisted the introduction of DSL because it made ISDN look like the useless overpriced thing that it was. And so DSL tends to be good up to somewhere of the order of 100 uh, megabits per second. Uh, so my internet connection here at home on the Australian uh, National Broadband Network, I can get about 60 megabits per second down and 20 something megabits up. Uh, and that, that's pretty uh, typical for these sorts of things. Uh, then cable TV, including internet over cable TV, the bandwidths tend to be lower, although again, there's been work on improving that, uh, particularly as DSL uh, kind of leapfrogged it uh, over successive generations. Uh, and then fiber to the home, uh, which again, some of uh, the, the luckier folks here in Australia have fiber to the home as part of the NBN, uh, and they can get, you know, the fiber optic will typically carry yeah, even more than 50 megabits, it's typically hundred, hundreds of megabits to gigabits to tens of gigabits uh, over considerable distances. So, uh, you know, it depends on the, the kind of access you have. Uh, again, what's not listed here is the wireless connection mechanism. So we know, of course, uh, 2G um, cellular was about dial-up speed. Uh, 3G was, yeah, between ISDN and DSL. 4G is pretty much up there with DSL. Uh, and 5G is aiming to get that fiber-like kind of speed uh, to the home. Okay, and we'll come back to encoding in the next video.